Hello, welcome to J Talks Live. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti, host of this webcast series, and I'm also the host of the CBC podcast, More. Today, we're talking about Canadian leadership at the provincial and federal levels and the response to COVID-19, the biggest health and economic challenge of our time. And joining me today is Chantal Hébert, a regular political contributor to a number of news organizations, including the Toronto Star, L'Actualité, and the Ad Issue Panel for CBC News's the National. But first, the Canadian Journalism Foundation wants to thank the generosity of JTalks series sponsor, BMO Financial Group, for making this speaker series possible. And also the CJF would like to thank the in-kind support of Cision and CPAC. A few helpful notes for this webcast if you're joining us for the first time. If your internet quality is poor, click on the click here to switch stream to view at a lower bandwidth. The quality of the video will decrease, but the audio should remain the same. If you are having technical issues, click on the request help button at the bottom right corner of the webcast page, and your request will be emailed back to the email address you provided. The answer, your help, the answer will be re uh, returned. This webcast is 40 minutes long. I'm going to chat with Chantel first before taking your questions. You can submit your questions anytime using the questions tab. And if you want to tweet about this talk, you can use the hashtag JTalksLive. So now on to our guest, Chantal Hébert, welcome. Thank you. Um, you have seen so many leaders navigating so many crises. What are you seeing in terms of leadership now during this crisis that has surprised you? Hmm. Uh, true, uh, I have seen uh, leaders negotiate uh, crisis over the years. Uh, none that was on this scale in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and uh, at no time in any of those crises was there the level of political consensus crossing party lines between first ministers uh, to the level that we are uh, we have been seeing. Uh, usually uh, in a crisis, there are differences in approaches. Everybody wants to do whatever is best but the, you can see some sharp uh, political divide emerge. At this juncture, after we're, we're what, two and a half months in, what may be the longest period of federal provincial harmony in the history of the Federation. Um, and you see that starting to weaken now? Not yet. Uh, what, what I talked has been a, a strength uh, of this, this crisis and the way it has been managed is that uh, no one has given up ground to someone else, and uh, i.e. Uh, the federal government has been very proactive on a number of fronts that are totally within its area of jurisdiction, but at the same time more respectful uh, of what the provinces do and where their sovereignty is politically, education, healthcare, uh, than possibly previous uh, liberal government. And that probably has a lot to do with the fact that the, while the prime minister and the premiers have been of one mind on many issues, uh, the premiers, most of them not liberal, uh, and none of them liberal in the larger provinces, are also very mindful of what their knitting is and what the federal government is. Uh, and uh, it could have been a big weakness. Uh, we've seen federal provincial showdowns, I think, for one, it's unrealistic to expect in a crisis like this one, which has very practical implications, to expect a one-size-fits-all kind of leadership coming from the top uh, down uh, and saying, well, we are going to treat Prince Edward Island and its situation in the same way that we approach what is going on in Ontario. But also, you know, there's a lot of trial and error taking place uh, at this juncture. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that while they're all in the same framework, some provinces are trying things out, others are not. François Legault in Quebec was the first to throw himself in the very cold swimming pool of reopening schools, and then he did not. Uh, but he was the first to test the waters. I think that educated other premiers as to what to do and what not to do to manage uh, those touchy issues. Uh, the same goes for other provinces. I think BC, in many ways, has emerged as, as kind of a template for doing things right. 
Uh, and so provinces have been learning from each other at the same time as they've been coordinating with the federal government. I think that's been a constructive uh, approach. And, and no, for now, I don't see huge cracks. I think because there is a common will to make sure not to have those cracks, and they do exist, become huge uh, gaps between provinces or between the federal government and the provinces. It's interesting what you say about BC too, huh? because um, in, in BC, it seems to me more than in any other jurisdiction, we've seen the, the, uh, the premier um, cede to Dr. Bonnie Henry, like she is the, the main voice, not the premier every day in briefing. Uh, and I think there's a lesson there that maybe has been learned a bit uh, late in the game by premiers such as Francois Legault. Uh, the Quebec premier early on was scoring incredible uh, approval rating scores that we've not seen on this side of a democracy or the Canadian democracy or a Quebec uh, in our lifetimes. But over time, and as the, the harder part, which means the timing of what you reopen, how you go about it, how risky it is. Um, the perception set in uh, that maybe the health authorities were being politicized or, or that they were being made to validate what politicians wanted rather than politicians taking their lead from uh, health officers. So I think the BC approach on that has been um, fairly solid. On the other hand, I, I do think that um, most Canadians do want to see their premiers uh, on the front line and the prime minister on the front line. And if you look at the polls, you know, how many, by now, Justin Trudeau will probably have given more news conferences than any premier prime minister that we've ever covered um, to the point where I don't think we'll be signing petitions in the press gallery to have more press conferences for a while. Uh, and it seems to work. I mean, it, it works politically, but it, it also seems to have generated uh, a, an uncommonly high amount of public approval for the measures that he has put in place. Talk to me a little bit more about what you're seeing in, in the approval polls. I, I'm not the polling expert, but I, I think over time you, you look at numbers like that and you do say there's a lot of fool's gold in there. Uh, it's nobody is going to uh, who is in office in an adversarial system like our system is uh, going to uh, enjoy an approval rating of 75 percent 80 percent forever uh, and that doesn't uh, really mean partisan approval uh, or shouldn't translate into that i go back to the the closest case uh, which would be the ice storm in 1998 in Quebec and Premier Lucien Bouchard kind of pioneered this um, approach of having Premier next to expert uh, on a daily basis saying this things are going to be okay, this is what we're doing today, this is the answer to that and uh, to have the expert answer. Lucien Bouchard at that point, so we're in January 1988, is riding really high on the polls. Uh, the approval uh, ratings he gets for the managing the ice storm uh, is huge. And think of it, you know, Hydro-Quebec is, is an icon in this province. The notion that it's failing uh, in the way that it failed so graphically at the time is, should be a big blow. But then fast forward, uh, what, uh, eight, nine months later, provincial election, new liberal leader, Jean Charest, and Lucien Bouchard does win re-election in a majority mandate but he, he loses the popular vote. And clear that those approval ratings, once you put them to the test in the ballot box, they will, some of them will endure. And if you fail miserably, you, you will lose. But if, if you're standing at 75%, the opposition looks like it's dead in the water. I think that in Ontario and Quebec, for instance, there won't be a provincial election if the premiers stick to the fixed date elections in those provinces for at least another, what, uh, about two years, maybe three. Well, at that point, we are going to be somewhere else, which may be economically a very difficult period. And over that time, for sure, more debate uh, and less consensus will have emerged. 
Let's talk a little bit more about the opposition because the federal conservatives, of course, are, are prepping for leadership uh, contest. They're in the middle of a leadership contest. What, uh, what are you thinking as you watch Andrew Scheer and as you watch that leadership contest go forward? I think in saying? hindsight, uh, and hindsight is 2020, especially in this case, in hindsight, uh, the Conservatives would have been better served by appointing a different interim leader than Andrew Scheer, uh, that they expected that all they would have to do would be to handle question period uh, for a few months, and then they would have a new leader in June. That is not what has happened. and. Uh, Andrew Scheer's handling of the party over the course of this pandemic has been tone deaf, uh, and it has cost the Conservatives uh, a lot of, of, of ground that its successor will have to try to catch up to. I would say that he has is, he is messed up his exit from, from the front line uh, over the past few months. And, and I have a point of comparison for some reason, the Conservatives, this is the second time that a Conservative Party in official opposition is faced with a landmark crisis at the time when it is picking a new leader. And the last time was 9-11, when Stockwell Day was campaigning for his own job and was the leader of the opposition as leader of the Canadian Alliance. And if you compare the performance of the Canadian Alliance in the months that followed 9-11 against the backdrop of that leadership campaign where Mr. Day himself was a candidate to the performance of uh, Andrew Scheer over those same months, you would find that uh, the official opposition was really more competent uh, and did not look like a party that was leaderless and headless uh, in the way that the Conservatives had looked over the past uh, two, three months. Whether they can catch up uh, once they have a new leader uh, is for um, whoever wins to figure out, but uh, it will be uh, a bigger rebuild than might have been the case uh, if the, the past three months had been spent in other ways. I mean, the Conservative Party federally is the big loser federally of the past three months. The NDP has lost a few points here and there, but uh, is mostly stable. The Bloc Québécois is held solid uh, and both of those have not gone aggressively after Justin Trudeau uh, and seem to have captured the public mood. When you see uh, advertising from a federal party, the official opposition that says, uh, Justin Trudeau has failed you, and there is 80% approval rating for every single measure or almost every single federal measure, uh, you think, on what planet can you think that you will have an audience when you start off with a perception that has absolutely nothing to do with how the audience you're trying to expand is thinking? And and how, what do you like in in terms of the actual contestants for this? What what are you watching? What what's really striking you as you see what they're up to? Well, they are in a difficult. Uh, position in the sense that this has not been a context that has allowed uh, people who are running for the leadership of the Conservative Party to really go out and recruit a lot of new members. That's really hard to do when you're sitting at home and, and you can't go out and meet and greet people and put some personal touch on what you're doing. So they're basically uh, campaigning for the, the grassroots solid base of the party. That base, every single poll shows uh, that that base does not really reflect uh, the mainstream voters you need to win an election. So if you're running to be uh, Andrew Scheer's successor, you may need uh, to get you over the top to win over the religious right and the social conservatives in the party. But they are immensely more important uh, inside that membership than they are in the general population. Moreover, the more influence uh, you tend to, go, to give those issues, abortion, same-sex marriage, the less appealing you become to the voters you would need to win an election. So on the morning after that leadership, I think at this point, most uh, observers have kind of given up on seeing real debate over what happens next uh, once there's, you know, once we're past the pandemic, 
but I'm guessing the test of that new leader is going to be to, to, to come up with something that looks like something other than a critique of what Justin Trudeau may or may not have done over the past four, five, six months by the time uh, he or she has chosen. Um, you touched on a couple of minutes ago the, the issue of the economy, and we may be in a different place in two or three years. Um, but if you look at where we are right now, are you in the camp that thinks Justin Trudeau um, will or should right, do a, an election quicker than, than planned? Will and should are two different things in this case. I am convinced that once we've turned the corner on the pandemic, and that's not tomorrow, and that uh, certainly is not till uh, in 2020. But suppose that this time next year, we have been fortunate enough to have this pretty much under control. Then the point will certainly be made by smart liberal strategists to the prime minister that this is a good time to ask for a new mandate before he has to um, do something about the, the, the fiscal situation of the federal government, which uh, eventually would translate into things that most taxpayers will probably not like. So the rationale would be go while you're still in the stimulus period, in the good news period, uh, uh, rather than in the pain, uh, inflicting pain period. I'm not sure that I agree with that, but that's based also on my sense of what third mandates have been in this country. Uh, and I take you back, you were there, to just uh, to Jean Chrétien's third mandate. Remember that? Uh, third majority win, uh, followed uh, by a civil war within the Liberal Party, uh, and the entire third mandate was consumed by leadership politics. Uh, and a clock ticking on Jean Chrétien's leadership, well, had it not been for 9 11, which forced the government of the day to take action, uh, Mr. Chrétien's legacy would not have been the legacy that he had because of his decisions on the Iraq war, uh, et cetera. Stephen Harper's third mandate was, you know, finally a conservative majority, the first in this country in decades, and ended up uh, being less than his minority mandates. Again, with forever questions as to will he run, will he not run, should he not go? And in both cases, Jean Chrétien and Stephen Harper, scandals uh, over patronage uh, in one case uh, and the Senate, over the, uh, the, the sponsorship program in the other. So me, I think that Jean uh, Justin Trudeau calls an election on the morning after he is reelected, if he is reelected, especially to a majority, people uh, inside the Liberal Party start thinking about his successor. Hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, the long tail on this, like the, the economy. Um, we're, we're going to see a lot of changes, obviously. Um, and I'm wondering what big policy changes you are thinking about that may come out of this and what kind of fight that might also generate. You know, we talked about the creative tension between the non-liberal premiers and the prime minister. I don't for a second believe that Francois Legault or Doug Ford or Jason Kenney uh, converted to the notion of a big, strong central government uh, over the course of this crisis. Uh, and if anything, um, they are not going to be buying into a host of new federal led programs unless there's a lot of money that the federal government no longer has on the table. So strangely enough, I've come to think that maybe we'll see progress on childcare uh, and cooperation on childcare. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, uh, but the, the, there is a new door opening for federal politicians and, and pro public childcare advocates as a result of this crisis, and it's the economy. Unless you get proper childcare in place, it's going to be very hard to get the economy back to where it was because parents without childcare need to work. So there, there could be space there. I'm sure that uh, there will be discussions about, uh, you know, uh, basic income, replacing the current uh, social safety net by something other. I believe that uh, there will be a lot of pushback from the provinces as they're currently um, 
configured uh, politically uh, against any uh, initiative that would end up giving more social policy leadership to the federal government. I don't believe there's been a sea change in attitudes on that. And speaking from uh, this province, you know, I saw the, I think it was uh, Abacus poll this morning that asked, or Liji, one or the other, um, who do you think has the lead or should have the lead on reopening the economy and reopening, uh, going back to normal life? And the numbers uh, were, you know, 60% believed it should be the provinces. It's a two to one to the federal government. But when you looked at the breakdown provincially, little has changed. What drives these numbers are provinces like Quebec and Alberta, where the overwhelming majority is saying the lead is with the provinces, which is totally traditional uh, response from those provinces. You look at the numbers for Ontario and it's split almost 50-50. And Ontario has always been more split over the notion that yes, a strong central federal government is a good thing, in part because many Ontarians see themselves as Canada, it helps. But so I, I don't think federal provincial attitudes or, or, or the or voters' outlooks on who does what have changed dramatically, even as they approve of Justin Trudeau's uh, strategies, they have, I don't think are suddenly thinking we need the federal government to you know, be the senior government in this country. And of course, that's a double-edged sword for the provinces because um, uh, they are not only responsible for those jurisdictions that we can all reach out and touch, um, they, they are also will get the credit or the blame. And there will likely be more blame than credit going forward uh, when you discover, you know, your former child here space doesn't exist anymore because of social distancing, uh, classrooms, how, the, how will that work in uh, places like Toronto and Montreal where spare space for classrooms uh, with 15 students instead of 30 work out? Uh, they, 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 what has happened in long-term care homes is something that goes right to the laughs of the premiers. I'm guessing that the, both Francois Legault and, and Premier Ford are kind of happy to be leading new governments that have not been in power over the past decade uh, so that they can share some of this. Blame certainly for not seeing this coming in the immediate crisis, but for the systemic problems that have been brought to the fore. Uh, the blame is shared with opposition parties, once again, making the job of being an opposition party difficult. Do you think the public um, might want to demand a, a federal oversight on, on something like elder care, given what's happened in long-term care in provinces across this country? I'd be amazed, uh, at least uh, looking at it from the perspective of the province that has had the most deaths. I, I see uh, a lot of public questions, popular uh, discomfort, unease, anger over what has happened. But that, as far as I can tell, is not translating into the notion that the federal government uh, should suddenly take a bigger role in running the health system, uh, which, by the way, it does not really have the expertise to do. Um, and uh, just talking about policy, um, there are those who are really pushing for um, some kind of integrated climate change environmental policy to come out of this as well. What's your read on that? What, what are you seeing? I think it I understand the notion of uh, using every crisis as an opportunity, but uh, it would probably over the longer term be a mistake to try to tie uh, climate change and the fight against climate change to uh, restoring the economy. I, I, I think if one uh, mood is underestimated, and I believe by the media, as, uh, along with all of the groups that see opportunities for change in what has happened. It's the fact that uh, out here on the ground, people want their old lives back. They don't think the past was bad and here's a chance to change it. The first thing they want is again, some normal life. And that 
I, I think the, the, the underestimating the, the appetite for a return to normal, the old normal, the boring bad uh, that we should change uh, is, is probably going to make some groups uh, cast their lots on, on unsustainable premises. I, we, we're bringing you change. I think people have had it with change at this point. It's not that, that there will not be public interest in climate change, but when you have a mortgage that you're not sure how to pay, uh, a, a job that you don't know how to return to because your kids can't go to school and not knowing where that or how that second wave will or will not come and looking at the two years horizon, you don't have a lot of patience for high-minded uh, talk about oh, well, this is a great opportunity to change our lives. Um, I think most Canadians feel that uh, we've changed our lives enough at this point. If anything, um, there may be real fallout uh, for the idea that the second wave, which we have been reminded and warned is coming, uh, which will mean likely shutdowns and more closing, um, that the, might, the reaction of how each leader handles that will be under even great, greater scrutiny, will it not? Up to a point, I, the thing is that the, to, to forecast three months in, uh, down the road is to look through fog and pretend to see a landscape. Uh, I'm guessing the hope is that, you know, better testing, uh, possibly better ways to mitigate uh, this virus, eventually a vaccine, uh, will intervene between the first and the second wave. There is too much that uh, experts don't know to forecast with any certainty, but for sure people are dreading uh, what happens next fall. And there is a general understanding that you can only stop uh, life for so long. And, and if you're, you're thinking of spending next, win next winter confined, everyone knows that at some point the cure will become worse uh, uh, than, than, than the illness. So, I'm guessing a lot uh, of um, government leaders have their fingers crossed that uh, over this reopening phase, people are learning to live with COVID-19 uh, rather than totally avoiding it. Let's go to some of the questions. I've got a long list of questions. I won't get through them all, but I'm going to start with um, uh, one from Richard Rin, who's asking, what are you doing during self-isolation? Well, I'm doing much, uh, I have a huge advantage over most people. I've been working from home for 15 years, so I'm used to being alone and yes, I getting dressed in the morning to uh, pretend that uh, that means my work day is starting. Um, and when I have spare moments, because I, I do have them, I can't, you know, go shopping for food all that much during the day. It's not all that pleasant anymore. Um, I do virtual babysitting for uh, my grandchildren, hoping to help their parents remain sane, sane. How many grandchildren? I have five, two and three, so in two places. But uh, so I've become really good at uh, Zooming with uh, things like books to read and stuff. That's terrific. That's, that's, uh, kind, that's... Of, it's kind of fun. Uh, I, I'm sure that when this is over, maybe I'll miss it more than they will. I'll give you a couple more questions here. Um, this comes from Catherine Sesto. Should the government and media withhold speculative information from the public as to avoid fear mongering? How would they know that it's speculative? So now I'll tell you a, a, a story for you know the school of certainty and we all know what is what. I was supposed to leave for uh, London on March 5th for a week off. Usually when I take a week off, uh, I do things I can't do working early in the morning. I go see shows, I go to people's places. So that was my plan. A week before I was scheduled to leave, I had lunch with a friend who's into the public health loop. Uh, it was a terrible lunch. He kind of drew me a picture of this other shoe uh, that was possibly, probably going to drop on the COVID-19 front. And a few days later, when a few villagers started shutting down in Italy, I canceled my flight and I did not leave. 
This is March 5th. But I barely told anyone because I was afraid people would laugh at me for having canceled the trip. I would have returned on the day of the big shutdown a week later. So when people say, oh, you know, we saw this coming, I remind myself that I pretended I was away for a week and did all kinds of other things like fill prescriptions and stuff like that because I didn't want to tell anyone that I chickened out of flying to London. So to, this is a roundabout way to answer the question about how would governments know what's speculative and why would they be the judge of that? Uh, so no, I can't see what uh, knowledge they would bring that would allow them to say, you know, masks are not necessary. Masks are very, very useful. Uh, everyone is kind of uh, treading uh, on unexplored uh, territory. That is, uh, that is part of the experience, isn't it? We are all trying to figure things out and um, we can get information, but we've got to sort through it ourselves in some ways and look for the right sources because yes. we're uh, all learning. And so I'm, I'm old enough to have been around when HIV first came about. I remember, you know, what, what used to be said at first, how it evolved, uh, how we got to the knowledge that we have today. It did not happen over the course of three months. Uh, and a lot of assumptions over that period were proven wrong. Others sadly turned out to be right. Uh, but that, that is how acquiring experience happens. And this is, we're, we're into sadly an experiment, a collective one. David Latimer has a question. Uh, it seems the media are much tougher on their leaders in the US than they are in Canada. <laughs> Not as much pushback on reopening plans and testing and tracking strategy, for example, do you agree? No, but I, I nor do I suffer from envy of um, the political leadership in the US. Uh, I, I agree that there is not in this country a mainstream politician that is uh, arguing that uh, we should just reopen the economy and everything will be nice and dandy. Uh, so journalists, have to cover uh, to cover an argument, you have to have an argument. I'm not seeing any opposition party or mainstream op opposition party in any province or first minister uh, arguing or saying uh, the kind of things that Donald Trump is saying. And if any of them were, uh, there would be a lot of pushback for the notion that uh, JavX is good for your health. <laughs> Um, well, uh, in line with that, then on the other, uh, on the cooperative side, Wilf Day writes, uh, the coalition government of New Zealand led by Jacinda Ardern has shown how to deal with COVID-19. So have minority governments depending on cooperation between parties in BC and New Brunswick. Other stable coalition governments in Europe have done better than the one party governments like Trump. Will this make Canadian voters more open to the coalition governments which places with proportional representation usually elect? No, <laughs> boy. Um, it's an interesting debate and an interesting question, but I don't think that voters think like that. Uh, I, I think most voters do appreciate some of the give and take that we've seen in federal and provincial politics over the past few months. And I don't see very many people missing the kind of cheap partisanship uh, that is often a feature of our politics. But whether that translates into you know, a sudden, uh, let's have coalition government, I'll just question one premise in, this, uh, in the question. I'm not sure that most Canadians uh, find coalition government abhorrent. If you propose one, there might be, you know, if Justin Trudeau tomorrow morning decided that he would like to have uh, uh, invite Jack Mead Singh to sit in his cabinet as his health minister or deputy prime minister, I don't think that many liberals would object. I suspect most new Democrats would be overjoyed. If I add up their two scores, I get to an overwhelming majority of voters. Interesting. I'm not suggesting that he should. I'm just saying if that happened, uh, I don't think it would be poorly received. 
Uh, here's a question from Faye Cohen. How badly, with how badly some U.S. states have dealt with the COVID crisis, what do you think will happen with opening the border? Any of our borders with the rest of the world? We will at some point reopen our borders uh, as Europe is tentatively reopening borders between its member states. Uh, the, ex the mention earlier about the, the success of New Zealand. New Zealand does not have the U.S., uh, as a land neighbor uh, and the level of exchanges between the two countries, people going back and forth is significant. Which is why I suspect that if uh, most premiers starting with those in Ontario and Quebec have their way, we would keep the border limited to essential travel for at least until the fall. And I see from polls that the majority or a plurality of Canadians would uh, like the border to remain closed until the, the, the end of the year. So uh, I, I am not necessarily convinced that we will be going to the beaches south of us within the next uh, two months. But uh, the issue always is that you have to, this is something that has to, it's a two way street. So you've got to have the Americans on side. So uh, probably in this country, political pressure on uh, Justin Trudeau from the provinces will be to keep the border as shut as possible going forward. Do you anticipate that being a bit of a, a fight with the US to, to do that? Or will they not notice? I mean, I know there's a lot of trade, but I'm thinking about the US public in general. Uh, I suspect that as long as trade uh, and, and the people who work on both sides uh, are able to, to go back and forth. And given that we've canceled a lot of the things that draw people to this country in the summer, things like, you know, that there, there's not gonna be a Montreal Jazz Festival, which is when I see the streets uh, around my house filled with US cars. Uh, so uh, no Grand Prix, you know, we've canceled summer <laughs> except for the weather. So yeah. I'm not too sure that uh, there are people lining up to cross the border to come into Canada or vice versa. Here's a question uh, from Kate Bandura. How does COVID-19 affect Canada's role in the rule-based world order? Oh, I don't think that Canada has a central role as in uh, a, a superpower role in rule-based order. I, I also think that the more interesting question is um, where does, will the U.S. Uh, fit into this world, uh, the post-pandemic world? Because up to a point, uh, and that is also true, I'm guessing, of the current U.K. government, isolationism uh, may be finding new strength from the pandemic. The notion that if you can isolate yourself, you're going to be better. The, the idea that you can close your borders and, and that's a good public policy uh, means that countries who depend on trade, and we are one of them, uh, will have to try to find allies uh, to, to, to argue uh, the case that we can't go back to a time when countries were separated by walls. We, we've moved past that. And it's uh, a lot of the way forward will, will depend on the outcome of the US election next November. Hmm. Got a journalism question for you from Shadi Afifi. Do you think the current epidemic writes the last chapter of paper journalism hmm. and shifts into hmm. using technology? Um, and I'm just gonna say at another level, I, it's, uh, I'm shortening the question there, but. I'm not a news manager and I'm glad I am not. So I'm not going to be answering the question except to note that uh, the, most of the news already moves through uh, more technologically advanced means than a paper copy. Uh, and, and that has been the trend for a good number of years. So the, the, and the issue is not changed in the sense that it is not, we've never had so many readers again during this period, more and more and more readers. The issue is always the same. 
what is the financial model that replaces the advertising that used to make paper or print publications uh, profitable? Uh, and that quest is, remains unresolved. It's probably made more acute by the losses incurred uh, over the past three, four, five months. So beyond that, I'm not even going to chance a guess as to how long we can keep our print uh, papers going in this country. I'm going to just do one final question, Chantel, um, and this one's from me. What kind of political reckoning do you see coming down the road? That's interesting. Um, I'm hoping it's not a political reckoning or a prediction. I'm hoping that this period will have given the opposition parties who have been taken off the stage by the crisis a chance to evaluate how useful and how constructive they could be going forward because we will have to have some very difficult but fascinating public policy debates uh, once the crisis is passed. And I think watching, you know, the premier whose image is most changed in this has been uh, Premier Ford. If you buy the numbers, but also by the, the sea change in the perception. What that tells me is that there's always a best to be had from your politicians. And we've had a lot of the best from the premiers. I'm hoping that the opposition brings their best game and not in the partisan sense to what comes after. Well, that's a lot to think about and watch for. Thank you for your insights today. Thank it's you. Great to talk to you. Thank you. That's uh, Chantal Hébert. We're going to end it there. Thank you, everyone, for listening and sending in your questions. We hope you join us for um, a few more upcoming webcasts. Next Thursday, May 28th, Heather Scofield, economics columnist and Ottawa Bureau Chief with the Toronto Star, will offer her, in, uh, her perspective on the implications of COVID-19 for the Canadian economy and covering the biggest economic challenge of our time. On June 4th, Susan B. Glasser, the Washington-based staff writer for The New Yorker will join us to share her thoughts on US politics, leadership, and the pandemic. You can get a sneak peek at what she's thinking uh, by reading what she's been putting in The New Yorker lately. On uh, June 11th, the CJF is going virtual for its annual CJF award ceremony to celebrate journalistic excellence. And you can watch that at one o'clock Eastern or the rebroadcast the same evening, 7 p.m. on June 11th. And you can tune in then with a glass in hand. Of course, you could always tune in at one with a glass in hand too. Anyway, view the details and register for these webcasts on our CJF website. And we hope you join us. See you next time. Bye-bye.